Now, um, let's look at this formula for the two-point function. Um, uh, get some power law uh, so that as we move these two operators away from each other, the two-point function dies off in a particular way with this power delta 1 plus delta 2. Um, and in particular, we can see from this formula that on physical grounds, Uh, we should have these deltas be non-negative. And the reason is that if the deltas were negative, then we would have two-point functions that grow with separation. Two-point functions of local operators that grow with separation, which um, is very unusual. We definitely expect correlations to die out as the two operators um, uh, move apart from each other. That's, if you like, plus the decomposition. Okay, so, good. So, delta should be positive. On the other hand, we have a symmetry generator that lowers delta. So, what this means is that there should exist, there should exist operators such that k mu kills them. Um, and sorry, for this equation, it was important here that I was thinking about k mu acting on the operator at the origin. So there should exist operators such that this is zero. Um, if not, then we could just continue acting with k and decrease the dimension more and more, and then we get some unphysical two-point function. And operators satisfying this condition are called primary. Um, and so just as here, if we uh, know how these symmetry generators act on an operator at the origin, we were able to use the Fermat algebra to figure out how they act on an operator away from the origin. Similarly, um, you can use this condition um, to figure out how k mu acts on an operator away from the origin. So um, this is an exercise. Use the conformal algebra to show that k mu acting on O of x um, uh, works in the following way. Where this little k here is the conformal killing vector uh, for a special conformal transformation. Um, so together, all of this stuff is 
a conformal multiplet. Um, and this should uh, maybe remind you of the construction of irreducible representations of SU2. Um, in that case, we start with uh, highest weight state um, that's annihilated by the raising operator, and then we act on it with lowering operators to generate the whole multiplet. This is exactly the same, uh, except uh, the primary is the lowest weight state with respect to the dimension, and then the momentum generators are playing the role of raising operators. So it's it's just the same the same picture. Any questions? Yes. Um, good. Yeah. So if um, it, so, usually when we ask about the dimension of an operator, we mean the dimension of the we mean the eigenvalue of d at the origin. But yes, you're right. There, the O of x is not an eigenvector of dilatation. Uh, it's a linear combination of an infinite number of eigenvectors whose eigenvalues are going to infinity. Other questions? Okay. Okay, so um, just as a summary, Using the conformal algebra, one can derive how all of these um, topological surface op operators act on a local operator uh, under the assumption that O of zero is primary. Um, and you can show as an exercise that um, the various formulas that we've derived can be written sort of compactly in this way. Um, and uh, 
so this is the exponential of p, m, uh, and d. Um, and the exponential of k is um, a little bit more complicated. And a nice way to understand it is to think about um, an inversion. So i is a map that takes x mu to x mu over x squared. So exercise. So I uh, is conformal. Um, and uh, the conformal killing vector for a special conformal transformation is just what happens when you invert, then translate, and then invert again to a sign. So uh, you can generate the conformal group by taking these simple transformations together with inversions, if you like. Um, and strictly speaking, this, this generates uh, more than just the connected component of the identity of the conformal group. You can ask me about details about that after the lecture, if you like, but I'm going to ignore those subtleties for the moment. Um, so this is a useful uh, tool to have in our toolbox to understand finite conformal transformations. Um, and uh, we're about to make use of it. So, um, good. So, we now have we now have information about how uh, all primary operators transform under all conformal transformations, um, and. Um, so the next step is to see what the consequences of, of this are for the correlators. Yes? Uh, I don't really understand how the, how the operator transforms under the special conformal transformation. Like, where is that? There? So you can read it out from this formula. Um, so the idea is uh, you take, sorry, for a special conformal transformation. Yeah, sure. Um, so. Um, I guess there are two, two ways to think about it. You can read it off from this formula if you like. So you just take uh, x prime of x for a special conformal transformation. And I didn't actually write it, but maybe I'll write it. So x prime of x for a special conformal transformation is something like uh, x, um, x mu minus e mu over, uh, over, gosh, I'm not actually sure I remember the formula. Um, here, let me write it like this. It's going to be um, x over x squared plus b over x over x squared plus b squared. Okay, so that's just what you get if you invert, then translate, then invert again. Okay, so this is some particular formula, um, and you can plug it in here. You compute omega and r, and then you use those factors. Does that answer your question? Yes. Stands for a representation of the notations. Yes. It's a matrix which represents. Okay. which represents. That's right. So it depends on the spin of O. What what D actually means. Yeah. It's it's not nothing uh, which relates with the formula. Thank you. Yeah. That's right. So that that might be confusing. So this is not related to the dilatation operator. It's unfortunately redundant. So what you do is, you, you, this is a special conformal transformation. Um, you compute this derivative, and then you factor it into a scaling and a rotation. It can always be done because that's the definition of a conformal transformation. Um, okay, good. More questions? So a lot of a lot of resources on CFTs actually just start by writing down this formula and just saying we're interested in operators that transform like this. And I just want to emphasize that it's uh, it's not an assumption. It really follows from these more basic ideas. Um, and so I didn't talk. I didn't say exactly how you exponentiate this to get this. 
Um, but you can trust me that it's possible to do that. And this we derive from first principles. Okay, so let's look at the consequences of these things for a correlation function. And for simplicity, I'm going to think about scalar operators. Um, and uh, the, the consequences work in sort of a similar way to the calculation we discussed previously. So imagine that you have your, uh, your correlator, um, and let's surround it with a topological surface operator corresponding to a finite conformal transformation. So if we have conformally invariant boundary conditions, then we can move this thing to infinity, and that gives us zero. So this is zero. Um, but we can also deform it so that it surrounds each of the operators individually. And then use this formula for how it acts on an individual operator. So what we find um, is that this correlator has to equal uh, the same thing that you get if you plug in if you plug in this thing for any u. So that gives us a bunch of scale factors. Uh, and then because we're considering scalars, we don't have any rotations to think about. And then the correlator again, um, but now evaluated at different points. Um, and this is a concise way of writing all the word identities um, associated with all the different conformal charges. So, to understand uh, the solutions to this condition, it's useful to do a, a tiny bit of algebra. So, exercise show that under a conformal transformation, the square distance between two points transforms in a nice way. So this should be pretty obvious for uh, translations and rotations um, and even rescalings. Um, it's not so obvious for special conformal <coughs> transformations. And as a hint, um, it suffices to check for inversions. And you can think about why that is. Um, and I encourage you to check it for inversions. So um, this is uh, just a useful bit of algebra. Um, and uh, good. So now, with uh, with that in mind, let's figure out. Let's take a look again at our two point function in a scale invariant theory, um, and let's see how it transforms under the formal transformation. So, um, using this, we get that c is one minus x two delta one plus delta two. Um, so this is equal to omega of x1 prime to the delta 1 plus delta 2 over 2, omega of x2 prime, delta 1 plus delta 2 over 2, times c over x1 prime minus x2 prime to the delta 1 plus delta 2. Okay, so good. So this is just a true fact about this two-point function that we derived in the previous lecture. Um, and now let's compare it to the word identity that should, have, should hold in SCFT. So are they consistent? Sorry, hold, hold on your further question for a second. Yes, what was the, someone was answering. Right, right, the condition is that delta one is delta two. Exactly. So, so the conformal word identity <laughs> um, is only consistent in this equation if delta one equals delta two. Um, and so, this is this famous result for a CFT. That the two-point function is fixed. Um, and the scaling dimensions are required to be equal to some constant here. Sorry, you had a question? Yes. Um, 
Um, well, so yes, yeah, so the deltas are eigenvalues of the facilitation operator when they act at this O at the origin. Um, and those eigenvalues appear in subsequent formulas. But because the conformal algebra requires that delta then appears in all sorts of different transformation laws. So yeah, no, it's true that in this formula, it, we're not acting with a dilatation around, we're not necessarily acting with a dilatation around any one of the operators. And in fact, we, we're, there's no way to act with a dilatation around every operator all at once. Um, so uh, th this formula is true for more, more complicated transformations. Other questions? Okay. Um, good. So this is a two-point function in a CFT. Um, and from here, it's not, not much more work to understand uh, what a three-point function can look like. So you can convince yourself just from this transformation law that you can satisfy the word identity for a three-point function um, by taking the following form. Um, and that's it. So uh, there's a constant up front, and then the space-time dependence is completely fixed by this word of the So that's the famous result about CFTs, that the two-point functions and three-point functions are completely fixed. Um, and this three-point function result, in particular, um, is crucially using uh, conformal symmetry, not just scale symmetry. So already in the scale symmetry case, we were able to get pretty close with the two-point function the scale invariant field theory. But for the three-point function, you could have potentially much more complicated form. Um, so the story for a four-point function um, is different. Uh, and the reason is that at four points, there exists what are called uh, conformal cross ratios. So we can name ratios of distances between the different points. <clears throat> um, and these ratios are constructed such that they are invariant under conformal transformations. So if you apply conformal transformation, then all these omega factors and the ratios just cancel out. And that means that in a four-point function, we can have an arbitrary function of these two of these quantities. <coughs> yes? Uh, so why did you write these two-point and three-point functions if we write after this constant C12 and K1 and three? Mm -hmm. Now if I compare these results with a theory that has a Lagrangian, mm -hmm. what kind of constants in the Lagrangian will correspond to these C's and X's? Right, so you have to do a calculation. So you can start with the Lagrangian, um, and then you can try to compute these two-point functions and three-point functions um, of different operators using the Lagrangian. And it's complicated. You'll get, uh, in, in a weekly couple theory, they'll have some expansion in terms of Feynman diagrams, and you'll get a power series and a coupling constant. Um, so actually, John Ray did one of these computations uh, already. Um, he was, he was looking at um, uh, a two-point function of, um, of, the, uh, of the operator Lagrangian F squared. Roughly, the gauge theory. And he found that at meeting order, it was equal to uh, the squared, or whatever it was. Yeah, squared. Squared, yeah. Uh, T squared squared, right, thank you. <laughs> Um, good. So uh, you could go to higher order, and so he, he did that by evaluating this Feynman graph, 
And of course, you could, you could have other contributions at higher order, or you could have some arbitrarily complicated thing, and these will give higher order corrections. Uh, in the theory he was interested in, there weren't any higher order corrections, because it was, I guess, that was for a free theory. Um, but in general, in interactive theory, you have some huge series of corrections. Other questions? So these seem like complicated things potentially, but I want to convince you that these are actually this is the most interesting and important data about the theory. These deltas and, and these these Fs and Cs, um, and we'll see that in a moment. Um, but let me let me go back to cross ratios. So um, uh, so by taking these ratios of distances, you can get the Omega factors against love, so these are conformally invariant quantities. And of course, I can take more ratios. Um, there are other ratios I can take, but the claim is that there are only two independent ones. Um, and the argument for that is um, for why there are exactly two independent cross ratios is uh, kind of nice and useful to um, think about. The idea is let's start with four points. Um, and let's think about um, how many degrees of freedom there are in those points modulo conformal transformations. So uh, we can start by, so if we have four points, we can start by using translations to move one of them to zero. Um, and actually, probably best to start with special conformal transformations. So special conformal transformations are inverting and then translating and then inverting. So, we can use a special conformal transformation to map any one of the points to infinity. By inverting, then translating one of the points to zero, and inverting again. Okay? So we can put one of the points at infinity. Now we can use a translation to put another point at the origin. Um, uh, we can use a rotation to put the, one of the other points on the line between uh, on a line between zero and infinity, and then use a rescaling to put it at a specific distance. So let's call that one. And by one, I just mean some unit vector. So now we've used uh, we've used um, uh, uh, so now we have three of the points on the line, and we have a fourth point. And to that fourth point, we can apply transformations that fix this line. Okay. So there's some rotations transverse to the line. And we can use those to put the fourth point in a, in a plane, in some fixed plane, some fixed two plane, uh, at some coordinate, let's say z, some complex coordinate z. OK? And um, these three points are fixed. This one we can move around wherever we want. It lives in a two dimensional space, so those are the two independent degrees of freedom, two cross ratios. And uh, if you like, you can evaluate these guys in this configuration. So u is z z bar, and v is 1 minus z, 1 minus z bar. OK, so a four-point function just has to satisfy the word identity we wrote down. Um, and we have these informally invariant variables, which means we can write down, uh, we can multiply any solution to the word identity by a function of those variables, and we'll get another solution. So for example, if we have a four-point function of, let's say, identical scalar operators for simplicity, then a solution to the word identities is given by some general function of these cross ratios <coughs> divided by some particular factors. Uh, and you can see immediately using that result that this, uh, this solves the word identities. Um, and so there's some undetermined function here. Conformal invariance isn't strong enough to uh, con these, these simple word identities aren't strong enough to fix this function alone. Um, but we do know a little bit about it. So one, one observation is that this four-point function is invariant under permutations 
of the excise. Um, and so by considering different permutations, you get some conditions on this G function. So, for example, uh, you have this condition. This is from swapping one and two. Um, and then this condition. Swapping one and three. And you should check um, that you don't get any new conditions from any other uh, permutations. Um, and this, uh, this second formula here will be our, our best friend. So, any questions? Yes. So they're, they're pure numbers, um, and uh, the reason is that the operators have some specific dimension, and then the space-time dependence on the right-hand side accounts for precisely the dimension of the operators. So these are just pure numbers. So, yeah, that's right. The function, the function is a dimensionless function of dimensionless quantities. Okay, so um, good. So we have these beautiful pure numbers in the two and three point functions, and then this crazy thing that we know very little about uh, the four point function. Um, but the thing that we're going to learn uh, over uh, the next several minutes um, is that actually the two and three point functions are really all there is to the data of the CFT. Um, the four-point functions and higher-point functions are actually determined by those numbers. So if you're actually powerful enough to use your Lagrangian or your Monte Carlo simulation or whatever to compute these C's and F's, then you know everything about the theory. Um, and um, this, is, this is still using consequences of, of conformal symmetry together with some properties of local quantum field theories. Um, in a really interesting and non-trivial way. So we'll, we'll talk about that next. Okay. Um, good. And actually, before I do that, let me just mention something quickly about uh, operators of spin. So um, the story for operators of spin is, is similar. So two-point functions, um, are again fixed by conformal invariants. So for example, a two-point function of an operator with spin 1 takes this form. Um, three-point functions uh, are almost fixed. For three-point functions, generically, there'll be some finite number of solutions to the war identities. So there'll be some finite number of, of unknown coefficients f's. Uh, associated to each three-point function. In the particular case that we'll care about of a three-point function of two scalar operators with a spin L operator, this is fixed. And you can ask me after the lecture for the formula for that. So that by, by fixed I mean there's just precisely one structure that's possible. And of course there's some unknown coefficient that goes in front of it. Okay. Um, good. So the next thing we'll talk about is a slightly different way of thinking about the theory um, that uh, makes clear that you can combine these ingredients in some interesting ways to do computations and will eventually lead us to the uh, idea that this four-point function is fixed in terms of the two- and three-point function. So the idea with radio quantization <coughs> is to um, uh, think about slicing up your path integral in a slightly different way. So when we, when we quantize a theory, it, you can think about it as taking some particular path integral, and let's say we pick a time direction, then we can slice the path integral on spatial slices. We have states living on those spatial slices, and then they evolve in time from one slice to another. And the idea with radial quantization is instead to 
slice the path integral on spheres, um, and consider a state that lives on the boundary of that sphere. Um, and uh, we evolve in radial quantization from one, from one small sphere to a larger sphere. So if we have some state here, then if you do the path integral between this state and some larger sphere, then that's time evolution, essentially using the dilatation operator. So the dilatation operator will be our Hamiltonian instead of some particular translation operator. Um, and one other statement about radial quantization is we can ask if we have a state in radial quantization, that is, if we have a state on the sphere, so state psi, how do we act on it with a symmetry generator? Well, the idea is that you just surround this state with one of these topological surfaces on the sphere. And I know all these ideas sound a little bit vague at the moment. We'll make them more precise over the next few minutes. Okay, so, so how do we make states in radial quantization? So probably the simplest state that we can make is the, is the vacuum. And the definition of the vacuum is that what you do is you, you take your sphere um, and uh, you um, for fixed boundary conditions on the surface of the sphere, you do the path integral over the interior. And I'll draw that like this. And um, uh, so what do I actually mean by that, more precisely? So uh, for any state, you can think of expanding it in field eigenstates. Okay. So here the subscript B means that phi is defined on the boundary of some ball. Okay? So phi B is a function of some unit vector. So it takes values on the ball. Um, and we can choose, let, let's imagine we're in some scalar theory with a path integral. Um, and so then a basis of states would be given by um, eigenstates of our scalar field. So this is a model you can have in mind. Um, and the vacuum state is just defined. To, to define a state, I just need to tell you what its coefficients are here. And for the vacuum state, the coefficients are, as I said, just given by a path integral over the interior of the ball. So what that means is that we do the path integral over the interior where our field in the interior is constrained to equal, um, to equal the field on the boundary. But we do the path integral over the field defined in the whole interior. So phi here is a function of, let's say, a radius um, and a unit vector, well, as phi, whereas phi b is just a function of the unit vector. Um, and this is weighted by the action. So that's what I mean by this picture. Um, okay, so the path integral gives us defines a state, um, and one important property of this state is that it's invariant under all the symmetries of the theory. And the argument for that is actually pretty simple. So, what is Q acting on the vacuum state? Well, we take this bit of path integral, we insert our topological surface operator on the, uh, on the sphere. But it's topological, so we can shrink it inside this region, make it smaller, and in particular we can just shrink it down to zero. So the vacuum state is invariant with your symmetry. How do you see it from the formula? Yeah, so from the formula, um, what you would have to do is um, uh, uh, a change of 
variables in the path integral. Um, so I, yeah, I encourage you to, to try it in uh, some, do some nice action and give it a try. Okay, so, um, so that's one state that we can create. Um, but there's another type of state, which is just a slight generalization of this, which is where <coughs> instead of simply doing the path integral over the interior, we do the same thing, except we also insert in here <coughs> some operator, O of x. Okay, so we do the path integral over the interior, but with an additional operator insertion. And the picture for that is just uh, O of x, back down the vacuum, is just defined to be this picture here, where we insert O of x in the middle, do the path and roll over the ball, including where O of x lives, um, and look at the state that we, give, we get on the exterior. So this gives us a way of, uh, for every operator in the theory, producing a state in radio quantization. Okay, so there's a surprising claim, um, which is that in a scale invariant theory, we can actually go backwards. So I claim that we can use the state uh, as an operator. In particular, let's consider let's consider a state that's an uh, eigenstate of the dilatation operator. And I'm labeling it by O at the moment, but for now this is just a random label. We don't know that it has anything to do with an operator yet. This is just some state. Um, and so how do we use this as an operator? Well, let me define for you a correlation function of these things. So the definition of this is that what you do is you take, you take your path integral and you cut out some spheres from the path integral, and you do the path integral over everything outside the spheres, and then on the spheres you glue in your states. So this defines a particular type of correlator, and actually so far I haven't used anything about scale invariance yet. Um, so where scale invariance comes in is the claim that you should actually think of these things as local, um, and not just some random objects that you can take correlations of. And maybe the quickest way to do that, think about that, is if we have some <coughs> local operators, we should be able to think about uh, correlation functions where they're arbitrarily close to each other. Uh, and the problem with this picture is that I haven't shown how to take these operators to be arbitrarily close to each other, because they have some finite size, right? Um, so for that, I'm just going to use I'm just going to use a trick. Let's define um, if the points are too close together. Let's use the fact that these things are eigenfunctions under dilatation, and let's just define this this way. Okay, so if these points are, are too close together, you can find some lambda that moves them far apart, and then you can evaluate the correlate there. And there are slightly more elaborate uh, arguments you can make, but, but this, is the, this is the basic idea. So if you have a state on the sphere, you can actually use it to compute correlation functions of that thing. And if, if you like, if you have some states on the sphere and some things that you actually have as local operators, you can compute correlation functions those two, you would just have additional insertions. Questions? Okay, 
So, um, so, so far I actually haven't been very careful for you uh, to define what I mean by a local operator. And so what I'm going to do now is something tricky. Let's just define the local operators of the theory. to be eigenstates of D in radial quantization. Okay, so I claim that for every eigenstate I can use it to compute correlation functions. So let's just define that space as the space of local operators. Um, and then once we've done this, then <laughs> The map that takes you from operator to state and the map that takes you from state to operator become inverses of each other. Where the identification is, is just the operator at the origin maps to its action on the vacuum state. <coughs> Because of the way that um, we've been approaching things, we're, we've actually been using radio quantization and the state operator correspondence already in a lot of our computations. So if we have some state, we can ask about how the symmetry generators act on the state. So what is, and sometimes I'll write this, by the way, it's just, oh, that. So we can ask, what is this? Well, I claimed that the definition of a symmetry generator acting in a state in real quantization is you take the state, you surround it with the topological surface operator. But that's exactly the same way that we define symmetries acting on local operators. Right? So this is just this is just just the same thing as <coughs> under the correspondence, this just corresponds to this thing that we've been writing before. And in particular, the condition of a primary operator. Um, we would just look right like this. So it's really just under this correspondence, it's now we just have a slightly different notation for things that we were already writing. Um, and in particular, our conformal multiplet now, we can write in that slightly new notation. We have some primary state um, and then descendant states given by acting with momentum generators. So on. And the action of the conformal algebra on these states is completely determined by the conformal algebra together with the primary this condition and the, the way that O transforms under rotations and rescalings. Yes? The definition of like it's a circle around the bottom space to define the operator. So the bottom state. Yeah, so so good. So maybe my pictures are a little bit ambiguous. So when I draw this circle and I fill it in, what I mean by that is this construction. So I mean this is a state that so the filled in mean filled in bit means I'm doing the path integral over that that uh, the fields in this region. So this is different from uh, this is supposed to mean something different from the pictures I was drawing for the topological surface operators. In, in that case, I would draw I would draw some squiggly surface, and what I mean by that picture is you're supposed to integrate the stress tensor over that surface and insert that into the path integral. Okay. So I apologize that the pictures look maybe a little bit too similar to each other, but uh, that's, that's the meaning of this notation. Yes? Can you explain again that the demand from state of the rate of the I don't understand it. You mean, given a state that you would produce an operator, meaning it's a correlate cross character? 
That's right. So, so the idea is, so someone hands you a state, and and if you like, you can think about that state as being some linear combination of field eigenstates. Okay. Um, and that's all you have to work with. And you want to define what you mean by this correlator. Um, so the definition is this picture. Um, and um, uh, if you like, I'll write an equation for, for what this picture means. Maybe that'll explain the notation a little more. Um, but the point is it will only depend on the data associated with this state. And Good. So when I write these equations, I'm imagining some particular uh, realization of the theory in terms of a path integral with the scalar field. Okay. Um, and that, um, uh, in reality, your theory might be more complicated than that. Um, you, you might have a, a, a path integral involving gauge fields, in which case the quantization is slightly more complicated. You might have a lattice model, um, and in that case, the uh, meaning of this is again more complicated. But the claim I want to make is that um, in anything that can be described as a continuum quantum field theory, you should have you should have some notion of cutting and gluing. So um, uh, um, so you don't have to take this too literally. Um, you can just think of it as a model for what these pictures mean in a particular type of theory. Scalar field theory. Okay, um, and I, I promise to promise to write what this picture means. So let me actually write that. So this is this picture means that what, what do I have here? Okay, so um, so I have these states. The states are field are linear combinations of field eigenstates, um, and to glue them in here, I need to integrate over over field configurations on this sphere. So I'm going to have some kind of path integral over the boundary fields on each sphere with the coefficients um, of these states in the field eigenstate basis. And then I'm also going to have a path integral um, over the exterior. Uh, with the condition that this field in the exterior has to equal the field on these different boundaries. And then this whole thing is weighted by the action. Okay, so that's what I mean by this picture. And the point is that it only depends on these coefficients. At nowhere did I have to actually have a local operator insertion. The picture in terms of yeah. this evolution. Yeah. Um, yeah, good. So, so to get this to this picture, we need to think about radio quantization. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand your concern. Okay, so so you can ask in what sense is there is what was I talking about here when I said that D was the Hamiltonian in this picture? Um, so that's related to a slightly different way of thinking about radio quantization. I think the cleanest way to think about it um, is to do a vial transformation of the metric that turns rescalings into an isometry, not just a conformal isometry, but an actual isometry. Um, and that's something that I'm not sure I'll have so much time to talk about, but the idea is that you do, actually, I think one of the lecturers already wrote this formula. Um, you can do a Valerie scaling that turns this into the cylinder, um, where now dilatations become time translations on the cylinder. Um, a state in radio quantization is then a state at some fixed time on the cylinder. Um, and you can now think about evolving it in time. Uh, if you evolve it in time from here to here, um, and then do a while transform back, then you now have a state on the larger screen. Great, oh goodness. Okay. Um, all right, well, good. Yes? Field, you would have to use right? But if you have many 
That's right. Yeah, I mean, for, yeah, it, you, you, the, the cylinder picture um, makes it clear how operators at a particular point correspond to states. Um, the fact that other operators at other points also correspond to states is harder to see because you would need to look at them on a different cylinder. Um, I think this is this is the picture that makes it all uniform. Okay, I'm going to use my three minutes. So. Okay, so there's an important claim that all states in radio quantization are linear combinations of primaries and descendants. So this is true, at least in sensible, sensible enough theories. Um, you can derive this starting from some uh, reasonable sounding assumptions. I'm not exactly sure what the minimal assumptions are. Please, if you're interested, ask me about it after the lecture. Um, but this is something that, that we'll have to assume for the moment. Um, so we have a way of constructing lots of different states. We just insert an operator in the sphere, in, in, in the interior of the sphere, and do the path integral. Um, and this leads to a question, well, what about what about more complicated constructions? What if we insert two operators and do the path integral? And let, for simplicity, let, let me put one of the operators in the middle. So according to this claim, um, all states in the theory are linear combinations of primaries and descendants. So that means that we must be able to write this as a linear combination of primaries and descendants. And then what that means is that we have some coefficients, and I'll package together the primaries and descendants by allowing these coefficients to be functions of x, the positions, and also the momentum generator. Okay? So there must be some equation like this, where k runs over the primary operators in the theory. Um, and uh, okay, so and in pictures, this is just a sum over k of some coefficients times an insertion, different insertions um, uh, at the origin. Um, and this is an equation between states in the theory. But, of course, we have the state operator correspondence. Um, so any equation between states is an equation between operators. And so by the state operator correspondence, we must have that this is equal to a sum over k, c i j k. And uh, well, what do we put here? So here, this is the separation between the two points. And then p just becomes a derivative acting on an operator. And this is the derivative with respect to x2. And this is now an exact equation between operators um, that you can use to do computations. Uh, and this is called the operator product expansion. Um, and the OPE will be our main tool for doing computations uh, in conformal field theories. And the key thing that it does is um, reduce, it takes the correlation of a uh, function of n operators, and by using the OPE, we can turn it into a correlation function of n minus 1 operators. And in that way, actually compute the correlator. Okay, so I'm sure my time is up. Um, are there any more questions? Yes. So the C you are writing down 
lambda that's the same as the f and the uh, three-point function? Good, so it's very closely related. So the first thing we'll do next time is we'll compute what this actually is. 